I do that. Okay, so now we're gonna start recording and now I'm gonna start sharing the screen. We're gonna look at my first set of PowerPoints. Yay, which would be so awesome. All right, all right. So officially, welcome to Biochem. And hopefully you guys can see all this. And uh, come on. There we go, blow this up a little bit. All right. Have that right in the middle, right? right down here. Okay. So, let me, um, those of you online, let me know if you can't hear me. I'm trying to project and I got my volume up fairly high. So, hopefully, this will come through fairly well. But I know I turn around and gesture at the, at the screen a whole lot, which I will also be trying to do with the cursor. All right. So, we're here in our foundations of biochem. Maybe. There we go. Okay, awesome. All right. Um, and of course, this is a Leninger textbook. Leninger was one of the key figures in it. I looked a lot at mitochondria. I like mitochondria because my graduate work was in there. Did a lot in bioenergetics, and he wrote a ton of books. It's actually interesting. I have uh, the mitochondrion as a as a book. Actually, they, there's a journal called the mitochondrion that was, well, I think it's relatively new, but it's been out for like 20 years now. So, anyway. There we go, lovely picture. We don't care that much, right? Um, okay, but our foundations in here, you know, um, yeah, and I should say, you know, if he died so long ago, how come we still write in this textbook? Well, there are, it's now called Leninger's Biochemistry and written and edited by a couple other people to update it. So the good news for you is even if you have an old edition of the text, um, we will still, you know, the stuff we'll be covering this semester will primarily still apply. Um, in the second semester, we just keep adding more and more knowledge. One of the things I really enjoyed about biochemistry um, is that there was always new stuff happening. And in fact, since I've been studying biochemistry, the field has probably expanded by two or three times from all its previous knowledge. So a lot of stuff has gone on there. A lot of stuff is continually being learned and turned over. Um, one of the things I really enjoy, you got W firm across the street there. I was like, hey, let's grow all the organs of the human body in a Petri dish. And there's a guy who's pretty much, he's even got neural tissue to uh, grow and develop and differentiate. Um, so there's a lot of neat stuff you can do. Um, I was always a big fan of kind of the dystopian future um, um, milieu when I was younger. So there was a particular game called Shadowrun that looked at this crazy future where corporations controlled everything, key cards and all sorts of stuff in there. And of course they had vat grown organs. And hey, uh, you know, now for the past decade, I've been working on vat grown organs. So you know, we can take uh, all the good and bad things about that. Yeah, I see dragons wandering around Winston-Salem. Yeah, let me know. Okay. I have jokes, they're not funny. Okay, so what we've got here, uh, our learning goals, we're just going to kind of look for chapter one, you know, what really is biochemistry, what makes it different from chemistry, besides being so much cooler, um, and more fun, and, and more interesting, uh, and more living, okay, uh, um, but it is living organisms. We'll look uh, a little bit at the structure and function of cells, we'll talk about the roles of different biomolecules, and then the key part that we get here is energy transformation and how living organisms utilize these biomolecules to produce energy to grow. If you think back to your physics courses that you've had, um, you know that entropy, you know, we're always getting more disorder, but living organisms actually become more ordered as they grow and develop, at least until you get my age and start dying every day. Um, we die inside, Dr. Ebert. Okay. Um, failed stand-up comedian, that's why I'm a professor. Okay. Um, so how does this happen? And it's just this separation, this compartmentalization. And we can look at this in single-celled organisms and, and in our, our uh, eukaryotes as well, too. We'll talk briefly about DNA. So really, this first chapter is just a big overview, okay? So how do we know if something's alive, all right? Well, typically, we're going to see a lot of, of um, um, complexity and organization in a living organism compared to, like, a rock, you know, which is just going to be maybe a repeating lattice structure. Um, we're gonna see that energy can be extracted and transformed to do work, okay? It's like, oh my God, it's physics. Yeah. I always enjoyed coming from physics to biochem because it was easier. Um, that's why, ah, never mind, never mind. Ah, don't wanna to editorialize too early. Um, the other thing we have is we have different components that are dynamic and coordinated. Um, 
living organisms can sense their surroundings and hopefully adapt to them, if at least respond to some changes. You can see this maybe even like simple cells will move towards a fuel source or they'll move away from something that's toxic. Um, the other thing <clears throat> is that living organisms can uh, self-replicate, all right? So we have a high degree of fidelity, so they need to pass on their genes and all that good stuff. Um, we have some lovely pretty pictures here where we have just have different stains showing the complexity of the cell, but I don't really like this picture. Yeah. We can look at our, our transforming energy. Um, I like this picture because uh, I think it was two years ago, I was walking uh, up towards uh, the administration buildings and there was a hawk that had killed a squirrel and was eating it by the sidewalk up there. Like not something you see every day, but then there's a, the, the hawk's mate was up there in the tree watching and waiting. So we can see our transformation in here, transformation of energy by eating other animals. Okay, um, and we can see our replication. Okay, so when we look at our taggers, they're gonna see this pattern of stripes. The pattern will be subtly different between the two, but overall we're still gonna have that, uh, that stuff going on. Um, so my question for you to think about is, are viruses alive? What do you guys think? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because you can assign all these characteristics to them, but when you get to the replication, there's a tiny problem. They can't replicate by themselves. They need a host. So viruses are kind of like our in between something that's alive and something that's just really complex, but not quite alive. So um, I tend to agree that they're probably the most basic living organism, um, even though they require a host for, the, uh, for some of their uh, um, life activities. All right. Uh, oh, come on. Let's do it this way. All right. Um, so when we look at uh, um, you know, living organisms, there are lots of classes of them. And you've probably seen some phylogenetic um, or, or evolutionary trees in, uh, in, in biology courses. Um, but we're just gonna divide things up into bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. Uh, so you know, these are typical our prokaryotes, our single celled organisms. I, I like the fact that we keep the archaea on here because we're gonna talk about some of those, especially when we get into some of the techniques that we talk about um, for biochemistry. A lot of that relies on particular mechanisms that have been isolated from archaea because archaea are kind of weird. Um, and you can see like these uh, thermogenic uh, organisms, like the, the little organisms that will live near lava vents, um, really weird for us. There are you know, the, the methanobacteria that are out there, various halophiles that can actually metabolize halogen compounds. So they're kind of like the, the strange things that we think of for, for living organisms, but they're important to kind of understand. Um, and of course, as you've seen, you know, we've got our six kingdoms of life, archaea, bacteria, protista, fungi, planta, and animalia, all that good stuff in here. Um, and you can see the first half are unicellular, the second half are multicellular, although fungi can be either. Um, trying an experiment, see if I can grow some mushrooms. I've got like four beds of morels I'm tempting to grow. So I'm loving this summer weather where it rains every other day or it rains a whole lot. So I got lots of other mushrooms. I got lots of toadstools in my yard. So hopefully my edible mushrooms are growing well. And if that works, maybe I'll try another experiment. Right. Um, so if we take a look at cells, our cells are going to be our universal building blocks. And we can kind of think of these as you know, our Lego pieces. And then we can assemble the cells into a more complex whole organism. Right? So you know, every living organism needs at least one cell. Viruses are, even they have coatings, usually. Um, viruses are really kind of neat and weird. Um, um, so simple organisms might only have one cell. Larger organisms tend to be more complex and have multiple cells that have differentiated into multiple types. Um, a lot of cells will have uh, unique features to them. So you can think of like your skin cells, compare those to your hair cells or your liver cells or your heart muscle versus uh, um, muscle muscle, yeah, whatever. Um, or central nervous system cells versus peripheral nerve cells. So there's classifications and differentiation, kind of like specialization. If we take an anthropomorphic uh, analogy, you can look at ancient societies where we're kind of like hunter-gatherers and everybody kind of had to do everything. And as people came together and formed small 
villages and towns, you got specialization. So you'd have like the blacksmith or the candle maker or something like that. So people would have specialized roles. Our cells in living organisms take on specialized roles as well too. Right. Many of them are symbiotic or helper cells with each other. So we can uh, do it this way. All right. Okay. All cells are going to have some common features. We're going to have our cell membrane out here, plasma membrane that kind of separates the inside from the outside. Um, you might see, you know, in plant cells, you may have a uh, cell wall in there as well too. Some bacteria will have that as well. Um, you'll have a nucleus um, or a nucleoid for bacterium, uh, where the where the uh, nucleic acids primarily uh, are are kept. Our DNA. Um, we'll see. You know, different organelles, specialized activity, mitochondria for power, or maybe chloroplast. Um, you can see various ribosomes in there. So we have a lot of these common features in here. Okay. Um, this is really more of a review. I'm not going to ask a whole lot about this, but this is stuff that generally you'll just kind of want to know. I think I probably need a little light. If you guys, okay, screencast. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Realize screen sharing is not the same as the video I see on here. So, all right. Our bacterial cell structure, um, yeah. we can look at these with our cell wall surrounding the bacterium. Um, yeah. A lot of things will have like little pili that are sensors in there that can sense the environment. So our bacteria know whether there's food nearby or something toxic nearby. And then the flagellum will allow it to move so they can kind of swim through media. Um, I actually had a, a friend, a couple of friends of mine work in the lab that looked at spirochetes. Um, so if you look, think about Lyme disease, um, um, it's caused by a type of spirochete and the spirochetes actually have these little spiral flagella. So you can see them kind of like a sine wave swimming through the media and it was really kind of neat. One of the things that my, my friend was doing was introducing mutation in there so that instead of being able to swim normally, they had crooked flagella so they'd swim around in circles. It's kind of like those you know, goats that have legs that are shorter than the other so they can only go around the hill clockwise counterclockwise. Anyway. All right, so if we look at a bacterial cell composition, our cell wall is going to be made up of carbohydrates and proteins. Oh yes, yeah. so we're going to be talking about all those coming up here too. And typically we think of the cell wall as being mechanical support. Um, we can see this in plant cells as well too. They'll often give strength, rigidity to the, uh, to the uh, compound. The cell membrane is typically going to be lipids and proteins, um, although it's, well, <laughs> this is bacteria, so yeah, lipids and proteins. The nucleoid is going to be our DNA with its associated proteins. The ribosomes will have the RNA. Uh, the pili and the flagella are both uh, protein-based, and the cytoplasm is our aqueous solution. All right. Um, so we tend to draw and oftentimes think of cells as like big bags of liquid, like a water balloon who filled up and you know throw it at your friend because yeah, no, I guess that's social distance. Yeah. Okay. Um, then, but really there's a lot of complex structure in there. So it's not quite like a bag of water. There's, there's an aqueous solution in there, but you have all the um, um, cytoskeleton uh, structural components in there. So there's a lot of rigidity. Uh, if you think of like a, the, the beams inside of a building that kind of hold it up and the little pathways and the roads within a city, there's a lot of structure in there. Um, it's convenient to think of it as a big bag of water, but that's not necessarily true. If we compare our bacteria to eukaryotes, which we'll do a lot, we're going to see a lot more complexity. So eukaryotes lack the cell wall, well, except for the plants, you know, stuff in there too. But uh, the membrane, um, the, uh, eukaryotes are defined by having a membrane-bound nucleus. So they're going to have a variety of organelles in there as well. Okay? Um, and this helps separate the, uh, and protect the DNA. It separates out some metabolic reactions as well too. So we don't have a feudal cycle. We can have energy consuming reactions in, in one compartment and energy producing reactions in the other compartment so they don't just cycle back and forth. We, they, our, our membranes allow selective import and export of various um, biomolecules in there. Um, our organelles are specialized. You know, mitochondria for energy, chloroplasts for energy in plants. Lysosomes will digest things, kind of break it up. Um, this compartmentalization becomes really important for cellular metabolism. Okay. So if we kind of look at this pictorially, um, we're going to see all the stuff that's kind of in here. Yeah, I think here we have an animal cell. So we see our mitochondria, our chloroplast. Um, 
the little kind of squiggly things in green that are on there. So you can see that are going to be some of our, our architecture. Is that right? cytoskeleton support and we kind of only are drawing it around the outside edge but it will extend into the center as well too. Um, at some point we're going to talk about the structure of mitochondria as well and we'll see why you know it's got a ton of internal structure and a lot of the structure is more than just a physical shape that it gives to the uh, to the cell. Um, if you get into advanced to biochem you'll talk about cytoskeletal um, metabolism where you add to one end or subtract from the other end so you can see back um, like cells that will actually move, they have, call it membrane ruffling. You're actually building up the cytoskeleton to kind of push it. If you think about like when you're a little kid and you know, your parents are putting the sheets on the bed and you kind of climb in there and push the sheets around, it's kind of like that little ruffling that way. And then the other end of the cytoskeleton is being degraded so that it pulls the cell along so it actually kind of flows. Like the blob. So, oh, that's, I'm going to reference movies from the 50s? What? Okay. Um, if you look at plant cells, we see a lot of similar stuff, but we also have chloroplasts in there, which are gonna be our, our you know, ways of heart, um, harnessing light to produce um, energy in here. Um, if we look at uh, animal and plant cells, um, they often have a lot of similarity, but a few unique things. Our plants are gonna have the chloroplasts, they'll have some vacuoles and dioxisomes um, and a cell wall that go with them. Our animal cells are gonna have lysosomes and peroxisomes. Those are kind of separating, but everything else is common in there. Um, in this course, I'm not going to talk about plants too much. I did have, you know, one or two students in the past who were interested in an agricultural-based uh, career. Um, so I tried to put resources up there for them. For example, tobacco mosaic virus was, is, is a hugely wonderful tool to study uh, plant reactions, and especially in this area of the country. Uh, I can imagine, you know, I learned about tobacco, tobacco mosaic virus up in West Virginia. Here on Tobacco Road, um, I'm sure it's uh, even more extensively studied. Okay. Um, but this is just kind of you know, our overlap, our lovely little Venn diagrams here. We could probably do this, we could add bacteria in there as well too, have fun with it. Um, if we look at the cytoplasm and the cytoskeleton, our cytoplasm, you can think of this as like heavyweight motor oil or molasses. It's an aqueous solution, but it's very thick um, usually. Um, our cytoskeleton is going to have microtubules, these actin filaments, and inter intermediate filaments. We'll talk about those in more detail a little bit later on, but they help give the, shell, the cell its shape. And they also play roles in cellular division. So when we undergo you know, meiosis, mitosis, all that good stuff in there, these architectural elements, the cytoskeleton, are going to help divvy up the cell and make sure that we get the right number of chromosomes in each daughter cell and all that good stuff in there. Um, we can, they also play a key role in the organization. We want to make sure that our ribosomes are close enough to the nucleus so that when we uh, trans, uh, eight, sorry, trans, transcribe DNA into RNA, that we can get the RNA to the ribosomes efficiently. We also have a lot of uh, intercellular transport. When we look at the actin filaments, we can actually see little carriers on there that will move along the actin filaments, like trucks on the highway. And cellular mobility, I talked about the ruffling there. So the cytosol, it's gonna take me a minute to get used to that. The cytosol is really crowded. Again, it's not really a bag of water, it's a bag of water filled with stuff. It's like the drinks you get from the fast food restaurants. It's like three quarters ice and you know, one quarter drink, right? My wife is the one who always like, no ice please, because she wants more, more liquid. All right, um, so we have all sorts of stuff in there, whether it's you know, DNA or folded proteins or envelope proteins ribosomes that are in there or you know, our, our structural elements all sorts of stuff it's crowded okay. um, and again it helps in organization here we can see um, uh, a, a stained uh, photograph of various actin and uh, uh, microtubule filaments that are surrounding the little blue um, is I believe a DAPI staining for the nucleus but you can see these cytoskeleton elements kind of run throughout the cell that connect all pieces of the cell it's like the interstate system right yeah, so we got organization. I guess this, you know, with these last seven slides, it's all about organization. Okay. Um, the other neat thing is our organization changes over time. Okay. So as a cell you know, undergoes different um, metabolic processes or different environmental uh, factors come into it, we can change the cellular organization. So it's kind of like being able to change our, our roads. All right. I'm going to ask you guys a question. I know the answer is no to. I don't 
relative to anybody who's really old in this class. There's a movie called Dark City from like the 90s, late 90s. I don't know if you ever caught this somewhere. And it's almost like a cult movie now. But um, it, it's, it's a weird, strange movie. But the thing is, there are you know, aliens or something, some sort of creatures that invade people's dreams. And you know, while people are sleeping, they remake the city to you know, test out stuff. So it's kind of like a, you know, a, a living, it's, it's like the Matrix before the Matrix. Like even the Matrix is old. But the thing I always remember is, you know, at nighttime, they kind of showed, you know, the little effect was, oh, this building crashes down, this building comes in here, these streets move over this way. So that is my visual representation for how cellular organization changes over time. It's like, we're just going to crush all this down and put new stuff in, in its place so that we can do what we need to do. We can, we can reach our goal for this organism. Okay. Um, you might come up with other things as well. How, the, how campuses change over time. Anyway, so that's a nice little intro into cellular organization. Um, as I, I always forget, you know, if you have questions, feel free to stop me anywhere. I know this first chapter and probably the second chapter, you guys will be like, okay, we've seen this before, okay, we've seen this before. It's now just about refining the knowledge and how we're going to apply it. So usually the first two chapters aren't too bad. Okay, but I love to hear myself talk. So. All right, so biochemistry, we're studying living matter, right? So we're really looking at um, biochemical compounds. And uh, so that means we look at the periodic table, a lot of those transition metals, we're not gonna talk about them. There's a few, it's like, you know, we got vanadium and molybdenum that'll show up every so often, but we're really taking a limited view in there. We're interested in reactions that occur um, in, in living organisms. So we wanna study chemistry that has a high degree of complexity, okay? And then I'm gonna talk about a little bit about organic chemistry, stuff you've done in an organic lab, you know, and then how we do this in a living organism. Um, so we want to, again, extract, transform, and utilize energy to do work, okay? To keep, to keep on living, because we've gotta keep living, all right? Um, all these reactions need to be coordinated, okay? So that we don't get too much of one compound or use up all of another compound. Um, we need to react to changes, whether internally or externally. Um, and again, we need to have this replication. All right, so we can start by defining where do living organisms get their energy from and their carbon senses. So ultimately, if you go back in history and you can see like there's so many different cultures across the world that you know, one of their earlier religious things was worshiping the sun. That's not necessarily a bad thing because everything ultimately comes from the sun, okay? But as far as living organisms, we can have our direct ones. Our phototrophs will get their energy directly from the sun. So like our trees growing out back there, sunlight hits the leaves and pinches on them and uh, have a mechanism in place to turn that light energy into energy. So we can have photoautotrophs, okay, where they can use, um, um, where they, our carbon source comes from carbon dioxide. Okay? And then we can have organic compounds in here, and these are our photoheterotrophs. So whether we can use carbon dioxide, like our lovely little tree out there, or we can have some bacteria, our green non-sulfur, purple non-sulfur bacteria, we'll use other compounds. These are com our bacteria that they've looked at, say, for treating oil spills, because they can consume the hydrocarbons in there, right? So if we can use uh, carbon dioxide, we've got our, our photoautotrophs, can they use water to reduce it? Then we have oxygenic ones. These are our plants. No, we have our anoxygenic um, um, bacteria, and like swamp bacteria or something. All right. So directly from light are phototrophs. If we need a chemical reaction, um, we're going to have our chemotrophs. And the carbon source there can come from carbon dioxide, organic compounds. So chemoautotrophs are things, again, they're going to be these strange little bacteria. Um, most other things we'll talk about are gonna be uh, chemoheterotrophs, where they're gonna you know, break down other organic compounds. Like for example, my turkey jerky and uh, cracker lunch that I had right before class today. Terrible, terrible thing. Um, or you know, my lovely Mountain Dew addiction that I'm trying to kick uh, for sugar in there. Um, our ultimate electron acceptor, some will be oxygen, okay? So it's gonna be all the animals, most fungi, a lot of protists in here. Some though will have things that are not oxygen. And again, we look at more, more uh, bacteria or maybe some yeast in here um, as well. Um, trying to think of something. Yeah, like for example, one of the experiments I ran 
uh, we did it in a, an oxygen starved environment and we use cyanide as the ultimate electron acceptor. And later on, we'll talk about why cyanide will do that at least once. <laughs> um, all right, so chemotrophs, phototrophs, um, and then hetero and homo for each of those. Okay, so living systems have to extract energy. Many of them will get it directly from sunlight. A lot of them will get it from different fuels. So our animals and bacteria in there. Um, so there's a logic to all this as well too. Um, if we look at the chemistry back here, we have to learn how to accelerate and decelerate our, uh, our reactions, how to get them started, um, and then how to slow them down once we've produced everything that we need. Um, we want to look at this organization and the specificity is going to be a, a key word that we're going to talk about a lot here. We're going to have very specific uh, requirements and reactions. And then the other thing is how do we store and transfer both information and energy. Okay. All right. So our, our hierarchy that we have, we have our whole cell and then we're going to kind of divide this up into smaller pieces. We can look at things like these supermolecular complexes of chromatin on the top there. Um, chromatin is basically made up of folded DNA, and our DNA is made up of nucleotides. Okay? So there's one type of biomolecule that we'll talk about, our nucleotides. If we look in the middle, we've got our plasma membrane. And our plasma membrane, um, we may have a lot of proteins involved in it, and our proteins are folded in a particular way, and they're made up of individual amino acids. That's where we'll start. And if you look at something like the cell wall and this lovely little plant cell over here, they're made of cellulose, which is gonna be a variety of sugars that are hooked together. So our building blocks are gonna be nucleotides, uh, amino acids, and sugars to make our carbohydrates. And then we'll also talk about lipids as well too. They're a little more unique in there. All right, ready for organic chemistry in like two slides, one slide? Yeah. So the important thing about biochem is we have a lot of carbon chemistry that goes on here. So carbon, we're carbon-based life forms. This is where this comes from. So we can look at how carbon reacts with a variety of other um, atoms, and that's going to help guide our overall um, biochemical reactions and understanding of it. So for example, if we look at carbon and hydrogen, you know, typically we can see you've know, got those, those valence electrons in there. Carbon needs four more. It can share with a, you know, one with a hydrogen and make a carbon-hydrogen bond. Okay? Um, that's going to be our, our basic uh, reaction in there. Um, we can also have our carbon-oxygen interactions. We can have single or double bonds. So we might end up making a carbonyl group in there. Um, we can see our carbon and nitrogen. So we can get our cyano bonds in there. Um, again, single or double. Carbon and carbon interactions. Those are often the hardest to make directly. Um, just because of the way, you know, the energetics that are involved. So we find a variety of ways to make single carbon bonds or to break single carbon bonds. But we can also have double carbon bonds and, you know, rarely a triple carbon bonds. All right. Um, yeah. So just the fact that, that carbon can uh, interact and form, you know, um, mono, um, bi, or tri um, molecular bonds, orbitals, yeah, overlap, yeah. So we've got our S orbital basically, and you can have two P orbitals. You can't have four because you can't get that Z orbital, uh, PZ orbital to fold all the way around. Um, all right. I can see my hand gestures on here too. I need a way to record. I don't know if that works. Anyway, um, so what elements are we talking about? Yeah, you know, we can just throw out two thirds of the periodic table or really like three quarters if we count the ones that we've made. But um, of all the 92 naturally occurring ones, we mainly are gonna concentrate on hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, and then a little bit of uh, chlorine, sodium, potassium, and calcium. And then the ones in, in yellow are trace minerals that we need. Um, you can see like tungsten is in there. It's like, what? There's like one or two reactions that talk about that. Or selenium, we'll see selenocysteine show up a little bit later on. Um, so, and then of course iron and copper are pretty important. Um, but if you think of this, I, I always, uh, my, my um, um, mnemonic for remembering which ones are in here are like ponchos, or actually because I'm old and watched chips as a kid, you know, ponches, yeah, but that's P-O-N-C-H and S. I'm gonna put O in there twice, because oxygen is so important. We need O2, I don't know, I'm trying to rationalize that. That's, a, that's a, an example of a mnemonic that's in there. All right, 
So, you know, we're really looking at what, six, 10, 10 primary um, elements and maybe another 10 trace elements that are in there. All right, so that doesn't seem like too much, but then you can start mixing them together. Okay, I know this is a terrible, terrible to visualize here. This is small, so you can blow this up on your own. And this is my second review of a, of a second slide reviewing organic chemistry. So if we look here, starting at the top, you know, we have our methyl groups, ethyl groups, phenyl groups. So we can have these various, uh, you know, uh, carbon hydrogen interactions. We get down into our, our carbonyl groups and we can have aldehydes and ketones. So remember all that good stuff there. Our aldehyde is at the end of an R chain and our ketone, that, that carbonyl group is somewhere in the middle. Um, we can also look at alcohol groups and various enol groups. Okay? Um, and then we can start kind of combining these and you can get your, where is it? Carboxylic acid ones, carboxyl groups in here. Um, amino groups, you can see the ones in blue um, are color coded to be nitrogen containing compounds. And we get some fairly complex ones that are in here. Um, we have an amido group up here. You can see uh, on the top uh, right, you've got the imidazole up there. Uh, so that's a, a ring structure that we'll see uh, with some nucleic acids. Um, you have phosphate groups in there. And of course, sulfur is really kind of neat and interesting. We'll talk about this for like, um, yeah. the best example that I've always found is really like uh, uh, hair, whether you're straightening hair or, or curling hair. You know, your genetics are going to tell you whether you have straight hair or curly hair. Um, when you get a permanent, um, you can change that. You can break those disulfide bonds that hold it in there and then put the hair in the shape that you want it to be in and then remake those disulfide bonds to have the hair hold its new shape. And that'll be permanent until new hair grows in, which has your genetic uh, shape to it. Okay. All right. Spent way too much time in hair salons now. Okay. Um, yeah, I was going to say these, these Zoom videos are going to be great, right? All my aside comments on here. Luckily, I don't care. I keep waiting. Yeah, you know, my videos are going to show up someplace. They're like, oh, a terrible professor. But, you know, I taught a class uh, for a couple of years. It was when they had the liberal, liberal learning seminars here. I taught a class called Drug, Sex, and Booze, uh, Illicit Chemistry. I'm like, surely I'll get on a list of terrible college classes. No. Uh, they just ignored us because it's a small college. Nobody cares about it. Anyway, um, that was my intention. All right. Um, so, you know, we have all those various functional groups. Um, let me just kind of roll back up there for a second. Uh, let's see if I can do it this way. There we go. So do you need to memorize all these? No. <laughs> for those of you online, I'm, I'm saying no, but I'm shaking my head yes. You don't need to memorize them but it's helpful if you, when you recall them. So I'm not gonna say, you know, oh, draw me a, uh, you know, imidazole group or something like that. But um, the more practice you have with, with these compounds and that you become familiar and conversant, you'll find that you know most of them. Um, I, could, I probably couldn't draw an imidazole group from memory, I have to look it up. But you, know, you start recognizing these compounds. And then when you recognize these functional groups, you're gonna start seeing how things fit together and how reactions are gonna be directed. Um, I took an advanced organic course one time, and uh, uh, you know, I, I joked that the whole thing came down to follow the electrons. So if you want to predict what the products are going to be, just figure out where the electrons are going to flow. So if you can kind of visualize the electron density in here, you can kind of see how things are going to, going to go. But the good news is living organisms, they're going to make one product unless something goes wrong. All right, so we got all these functional groups. Uh, what do we do with them? Well... We look at biomolecules and they're going to have multiple functional groups. Almost every um, um, biomolecule is going to have a ton of these, uh, ton of different ones on here. So if we look at acetyl coenzyme A or um, ACC as it's, uh, yeah, yeah, as it's known shorthand, um, we can see we've got a thioester group over here at the left side. We've got an amido group in here and another amido group and then there's a hydroxyl group and the phosphoanhydride and then midazole like compounds. Like, wait a minute, it's not an imidazole, but it's like one, so we'll call it that. And you can see we've got an amino group over here and a phosphate group down here. What this means is every one of those functional groups is a possible target for a chemical interaction. So we're being efficient, we can multitask, we can do lots of different things. And what we'll see with a lot of our, our biomolecules, we'll have one particular reaction that'll happen in one position, 
and we'll have another reaction that'll happen someplace else. And then those will be coordinated to maybe transfer a methyl group to build a growing you know, a chain, a growing hydrocarbon chain or something. Okay. All right. Um, so our ABCs that we have here, ABCs of life, um, we'll have some amino acids that are shown up here. We'll have some nucleic acids and we'll have some lipids. I guess we should throw carbohydrates in there. So maybe it's really A, B, C, Ds. Um, but we're going to look at all these. We're going to see our chapters. Like we have four chapters devoted to proteins. Ooh, yeah. And one chapter devoted to carbohydrates and one chapter to lipids and two to nucleotides, which I like because I'm a protein biochemist, or at least I, I was. Um, but um, yeah, but proteins can be more complex. The good news is the order we tackle them in, you know, there's less and less stuff that you have to memorize. So kind of tax your brain to start with and then ease on out to it. Should put up the Calvin and Hobbes thing where they're debating whether it's better to dive into cold water or ease yourself into it. We're gonna dive right in and then ease our way out. Okay, so if we look at uh, a lot of these biomolecules, their three-dimensional shape is gonna play a role in what they can do. So um, one of the things that I studied um, was the structure of compounds, but it turns out structure is intimately tied to function. Okay, we got to have a particular structure to have a certain function. If you change the structure, then you can prevent its function or you can induce another change. I'll talk about the Risky iron sulfur protein a lot. It's a mobile protein. I don't know if anybody can see this, but it just kind of moves back and forth between two different uh, positions and it ferries electrons in the electron transport complex, which we talk about in the second semester. Anyway, um, but we have stereoisomers, which have different physical properties. We can look at geometric isomers. These are things like our cis versus trans. Stick around when we talk about that because I have an awesome joke. Um, hilarious, because I'm, I'm hilarious. Okay. Yeah, put that in there. Right. We have our enantiomers, which are mirror images. So they just are around one particular one in there. And then diastereomers, which are gonna have different properties altogether. Again, review of organic chemistry, right? All sounds familiar. That's why we, we require organic chemistry, but it turns out we're not gonna do a lot of organic chemistry in here. If we look at our cis versus trans, we've got our maleic acid in here, our fumaric acid, and we just have this, this you know, double bond as our bridge. Our cis are on the same side, our trans are on the opposite side, okay? okay. Um, if we start looking at, say, like cis retinol, um, when light hits it, it gets converted into trans retinol, and this is important in vision and transferring signals along the nerves, along the optic nerve. We can see light kind of hits and induces cis retinol to turn to trans retinol, and we get a, a, a neural signal out of that. Okay. And again, we're looking at this particular double bond here. So it's 11 cis retinol. <coughs> it's converted to the trans form. All right. I'll make my joke now. I'll make this joke because I've got tenure. So <clears throat> a lot of scientific terms end up getting kind of pulled out of sciences and used in, in social sciences, more like that. For example, if we look at like cis and transgender. Those are relatively new terms. When I, when I was younger, those terms didn't really exist. So they're looking at you know, cis um, uh, where we're on the same side and trans where you're going kind of across. So like male to female or female to male would be transgender, right? So when you talk about sexuality, cis and trans get applied in there. But if you look at sexuality as a spectrum, and uh, accounting for like bisexuals or people of indeterminate um, um, gender. Um, it's really more of a spectrum. So what I find is kind of stealing these terms from science and trying to apply them broadly is really kind of gauche. Organic chemistry, gauche, when you know, they're not in you know, the line of there. Ah, see, it's hilarious. I'm, I'm, I'm so funny. All right. I just like to do that to annoy my, my friends in the, uh, in the humanities. All right. <clears throat> so, but of course, also, I'll make bad puns and bad jokes like that to try and help stimulate things so that you guys will keep it straight. All right, our enantiomers and our diastereomers, stuff we have up here, you can basically see our, enan our enantiomers, our mirror images. They're just going to be kind of rotated around one. This will be important when we talk about our, our protein structures because we're going to see that our, our central carbon in there is going to be um, enantiomeric. So we can have an L form and a D form. We'll also see this in our carbohydrates as well too. When we look at glucose, um, when we talked about alpha and beta linkages in there, it'll depend on the uh, enantiomeric uh, structure. Um, what else do we have? I don't know, where'd my picture go? 
Let's not do. All right, well, we'll just skip on here. All right. But again, I'm going to trust that you guys are comfortable with and conversant with the, the organic background. Okay. So yeah. yeah. Don't forget. Don't forget stuff you've learned previously. That's another thing I like about biochemistry. This is where you really start to build and see how the field comes together. Okay. So if we look at the interactions between different biomolecules, they're really specific. Okay. And we'll see some 3D structures that'll show up here. Um, I may try and do a case study where you can actually kind of look at um, a molecular interaction, but we do a lot of modeling um, to help visualize this. So a lot of macromolecules are going to fold into these specific structures that'll have particular pockets and only certain molecules will fit into those pockets and they don't fit perfectly, but more on that later. So if we have chiral molecules, they'll often be stereospecific. And I think I even have a great question about that on either homework or quiz or something, but we'll go over it in class, yeah. Um, so if we look at this three-dimensional structure here, we have um, a, a hexokinase molecule roughly in 3D, and then this is a glucose molecule that will fit right in here. And it turns out only D-glucose fits in here, and then when it fits into this little cleft, it actually becomes uh, phosphorylated. Our hexokinase is going to phosphorylate our glucose specifically at one particular carbon, um, and then it will release it, okay? and it will do that over and over again. And our hexokinase is only going to bind D-glucose. I think so. There, there are some that have you know a little more variability, so we can have different degrees of specificity, um, but generally. For our biomolecules, we're very uh, specific in what they will bind. Some can have more than one partner, but most of the time they're going to recognize one particular um, three-dimensional arrangement of one type of molecule. Okay. Um, so that's our specificity. Um, our energy transduction, we're gonna, we have to do work to stay alive. I don't know, there's probably a joke in there somewhere, but I'm, I, I do try and yeah not to say every joke that crosses my mind, um, but living organisms have this dynamic steady state. Ah, so this is an unassuming looking slide, but this is one of the more important slides of this chapter. So we talk about a dynamic steady state, right? And not equilibrium. Um, um, so let's talk about what those mean um, a little bit. And I think that comes up here a little bit later. Our dynamic steady state basically means that we're keeping roughly the same concentration of compounds in the body at any one given time. Now, obviously this changes like if we eat, if I like guzzle down Mountain Dew and Doritos, um, I'm gonna have a lot of sugar in, in, in my body that has to, you know, you know, I'm gonna have an excess of that and then I'll get metabolized. And of course, when you wake up in the morning, you're kind of in a starved state, you know, long postprandial, you're gonna have different compounds in there. But generally your body is working to keep this optimal level of, of compounds, of concentrations of all the different compounds that are in there. So we can say this dynamic steady state, it's constantly adjusting and fine tuning and fiddling with reactions to maintain the concentrations of all the major metabolites. Okay? Um, on the other hand, it, it, this looks a little bit like equilibrium because the equilibrium, if you think of like say diffusion across the membrane or equilibrium when you have the same amount going in either direction. Okay? So they're We've got the same concentration on either side because if we remove something from here, one from this side kind of comes over to the other, other side. Um, so superficially, both are maintaining concentrations, but equilibrium is just that the rate in one direction equals the rate in the other direction. Um, in a living organism, that rarely happens. The key um, mechanisms are far from equilibrium. All right. If a living organism has its reactions at equilibrium, it's usually dead. Um, that's our, our decay. There. So equilibrium equals death. Our dynamic steady state means we're focusing all these reactions so that the overall rate of all the reactions maintains um, um, our, our, our optimal um, chemical concentrations. Okay. Um, so how do we do this? A lot of these reactions are going to require energy to, to stimulate. Okay, they're, they're far from equilibrium, so we might need to put a lot of energy in to get over the um, 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 energy barrier. Uh, so we find some energy producing reactions that are, are, um, uh, are going to happen, and we couple them with the energy consuming ones. Right? 
So this coupling of reactions allows us to drive unfavorable reactions and produce things that take a lot of energy. So we couple energy producing with energy consuming reactions. Right? Um, we also make great use of catalysts. Okay? And again, a little bit later on here, I'm gonna compare organic catalysts with biological catalysts. Um, so our biological catalysts are gonna re reduce the amount of energy needed. Um, and they maintain specificity as well too. Um, and then um, basically, you know, if we have a living organism, we're kind of making logical connections. Uh, we're increasing complexity. So we are, you know, decreasing entropy in effect. So we're countering the, the universe. So we need to put in work and energy. All right. And then this slide just kind of talks briefly about that. And, um, if you look at potential energy in here, you know, things that are gonna happen spontaneously, you, know, you might have a mixture in here. I, I always like to think of this initial starting off as like the electron density in, in an atom. You know, usually it's spread out among all the orbitals, but every once in a while you'll get this transient thing where all the electrons are on one side. So you have this partial negative charge and partial positive charge. Um, you know, it happens very rarely, but that might be enough for something to happen, but that's not consistent, all right? So we start using these energy transductions where you can look at chemical transformations. You can look at using heat to drive something, to drive a reaction. You can uh, increase uh, um, in, uh, entropy in the surroundings to kind of help counter the reduction in entropy within the cell. And then um, you can just counter that as well there. All right. Anyway, don't like this slide as much. This next one I like, how do we speed up reactions? Okay. Probably should have asked that before I put the slide up here, right? Organic chemistry, what do you do? You crank up the heat, right? Or boil it, right? Yeah, so you can crank up the heat there. Um, this thing though, stability of macromolecules is kind of our limiting factor here. Can't really boil people. Um, you can, but that usually uh, doesn't help. Um, we can also increase the concentration of reactants. That's good, that's good. And you can do that in the human body, but you know, that could be expensive, especially if you have like small compounds or something that's rare. You might need a very large um, um, amount of starting material, um, okay? Um, you can change the reaction by coupling it to a fast one, okay? So that's something that living organisms can do. We can take the slow reaction and then we can couple it to one that is spontaneous and produces a lot of energy to drive it forward. And then we can also use catalyst to lower the activation energy barrier. So that's the second one that gets used by those. So we don't really see a lot of temperature change. Um, you know, there, there are temperature sensitive reactions. If you look at like the heat shock proteins and bacteria, you have bacteria that grow at 30 degrees, you heat up to 37, they start generating more heat shock proteins. Um, there's actually a nice slide about that and a nice little discussion about that in Biochem 2. See, now I'm still in Biochem 2. Um, but it'll look at the composition of the cell wall as you change the temperature um, for bacteria and heat shock proteins help stabilize at higher temperatures, the, uh, the cell, uh, the, the E. coli cell. All right. So I always think, yeah, you know, now this is where I got to pause for a second, put up here. I have this lovely little equation here. We look at delta G for how spontaneous a reaction is going to occur. We can look at our thermodynamics. I always like to pause and talk about my, my graduate level uh, biochem. Um, we had two textbooks, and I used to joke the uh, Zubay textbook was for the chemists coming into biochem and the Alberts the cell was for the biologists coming in or maybe vice versa because uh, Alberts the cell was great at explaining a ton of stuff about how these mechanisms occur in, in metabolism. Zube was fantastic at explaining the energetics. So Alberts the cell was like an 800 page book and it had three equations in it. Three, no math. Um, Zube had like three equations on every page. So whenever I approach biochem, um, I, I don't go, even though I'm coming from a physics background, it's like, yeah, let's do lots of math. I'm like, no, let's do enough math, okay? So we're gonna do like one or two little um, derivations. We're gonna look at some equations. Um, so we're gonna kind of look at this um, and we look at, say we have some two reactants that produce two products and our, our lowercase letters are indicating our, our molar uh, um, uh, ratios. So if we look at our equilibrium constant in here, we take, you know, basically our, our um, product concentrations divided by um, our reactant concentrations. Okay? So if we do some separation in here, 
fiddle around with this, we can actually come up with this delta G equation, where delta G is negative RT times the natural log of the KAQ. Okay. So we just kind of plug this in here, and we can see our delta G. All right. So what does this all mean? Well, basically, if our delta G is negative, we have a spontaneous reaction that's going to occur. If our delta G is positive, then our reaction is going to go in the opposite direction. Okay. Um, so that's what we're looking for. And this is our delta G naught. We're going to have our delta G naught prime and just delta G prime and all sorts of stuff in here too, because our our cells are going to actually. I mean, this is looking at standardized delta Gs. Basically, um, we're going to try and keep things far from standardization so that we can manipulate those values to make equations that we want to go forward spontaneous, or couple them to ones that are spontaneous and produce the energy to drive them forward. So, if we if we synthesize complex molecules. We're going to require energy, something that's endergonic. If we break down molecules, we often release energy, and that's going to be exergonic. Okay? So we couple endergonic and exergonic um, reactions in here. Um, so if our delta G is greater than zero, it's unfavorable. So to, to do that, we're going to take both work and energy. Okay? Um, we also might have a very high energy barrier in here. Um, I can't remember if it's chapter three or chapter four, but there's a great picture of, uh, of that um, that will look at the energy barrier and how a, a biocatalyst affects the energy barrier. It's more like a, a rumble strip than a speed hump. Um, when we break down metabolites like ATP or NADH and NADPH, um, we can synthesize these from sunlight and various fuels, but they produce a lot of energy. They're gonna be high energy reactions. Okay? So we're gonna couple these reactions if we look at an exergonic reaction here, our breakdown of ATP, if we cleave off with the end phosphate group, um, we will end up with ADP and a lot of energy, something like 30 some um, kilojoules per mole. Okay? And we can couple that, that release of energy with an endergonic reaction to drive it forward. So our, our mitochondria make ATP, we burn ATP to drive other reactions that we need. Okay? So in this example, suppose we want to go back to that hex, uh, hexokinase and phosphorylate a glucose molecule. You can see in this first one, that is an uh, endergonic reaction. It requires this delta G1, or requires a certain amount of energy to get that to happen. So we couple that with our, our um, ATP um, being phosphorylized, and this big red decrease in here for delta G2 releases a lot more energy. So if we couple these two together, we add these two um, requirements for delta G, our delta G total, we're still producing energy and we, we, we harness that uh, hydrolysis of ATP to drive the phosphorylation of, uh, of, of glucose. So again, energy coupling. I feel like I could just say energy coupling for like five or six slides in a row. All right, I have one more little topic I wanna to cover here today, uh, I think. Let's see where my slides are. All right, yeah, good, good, good. We're on, we're on track. Um, so let's talk about catalysis, all right? So we all know a catalyst is something that, you know, makes or speeds up the reaction rate of a chemical reaction, okay? So catalysts do this by, by lowering the activation energy, all right? Um, they don't alter the uh, delta G naught, they just lower that speed hump to kind of get over there. Um, we can accelerate a reaction under mild conditions by using a catalyst. Usually, I mean, if you think back to organic, it's like, oh, we're gonna boil it and put it in sulfuric acid and add pressure to it, and then we're gonna add this catalyst to it. But for living organisms, you know, we can keep those relatively mild. Our catalyst can be very uh, specific, and we can target our catalyst for regulation. And this is gonna be a key that we kind of come back to. We're gonna touch on it briefly this semester, but second semester biochem, we talk about regulation a lot. So our catalysts, allow us to regulate you know, our, our speed of reactions in here. So if we look at our, our catalyst, how does it work? We lower this delta G uh, double dagger in here, we lower that activation energy to allow us to make the, the products. Okay? So we still do that. This is a very big simplification um, for um, biomolecules. Um, there's actually a little bit more that comes on, which we, again, we have a better picture of this in chapter three or four. I can't remember which one. Okay, so 
let's talk about living organisms. Um, in organic chemistry, we're often just trying to do one reaction to get a product, right? Um, sometimes you might take that product and do something else to it, but usually you've got one reaction going on there. Living organisms are going to have multiple reactions. So you might convert A to B and B to C and C to D and so on and so forth. So you're going to have multiple enzymes that are going to be responsive for catalyzing those reactions. So this gives us a metabolic pathway. Eventually we can convert A into F by going through all these intermediate states. So for example, we might have a signal transduction pathway, which is going to transmit information through the cell. Okay. Um, we can also look at a, a a, a better example that I think to visualize this is maybe we are, we want to make isoleucine, okay? But we can make isoleucine through threonine, but it takes like five steps. So we've got five enzymes and five, inter, you know, four intermediate compounds in here. But ultimately, you know, we start with threonine, we get isoleucine, okay? Um, and our enzyme one has a binding site for isoleucine because when we make enough, when our concentration of isoleucine hits a certain, a certain threshold, then our isoleucine will feed back. We get feedback regulation. It'll bind to that enzyme one and stop this pathway. So we're kind of diverting this pathway. Instead of our threonine going to isoleucine, we kind of block that off and shunt our threonine into going someplace else. Okay. Um, this is negative regula regulation or feedback regulation. There's also positive regulation feed forward, but that's a little more rare and we don't talk about that too much. Um, but feedback regulation, very, very common. Um, and this is how we help maintain our dynamic steady state. Um, if we have certain levels of compounds that start to get too high, they're going to affect different enzymes, which will affect metabolic pathways and help lower those back down into normal levels. Hopefully, unless things are going bad. All right. Let's see, don't want to talk about this. See, I got five minutes. Yeah, you know what? I think this is a good place. We'll, we'll see how this uh, virtual casting goes. So I will post this lecture, this, this Zoom recording in um, um, Canvas as soon as it uh, gets back to me. Um, but we'll, we'll do that. We'll, we'll stop here for today. We'll pick up, we'll finish up chapter one and start chapter two next week. So I think that's a good spot. So let me stop sharing here. And I think, oh yeah. Okay, I'll stop recording. There.